how do we now try to, to measure what those damaging effects are by measuring what the radiation dose is that ends up being absorbed by the body? Well, so I want to start just really going through an introduction of some of the measures that we have and, and hopefully provide you with a better understanding of some of those. So these are the ones I'm going to go through. I'm going to talk a little bit about exposure and really the, the more modern quantity that kind of replaces that. But then some of these other quantities were basically derived from exposure. So I'm going to continue down the exposure to describe how absorbed dose was kind of extended from that notion, and then equivalent dose extended from the notion of absorbed dose, and finally effective dose from that. And really the important things that I want you to remember when we finish are kind of the basic definitions of these things, but also what they're useful for. And really, this absorbed dose is going to be the most important thing in terms of us deciding what the deterministic effects of radiation might be. So things like cataracts, radiation burns, those kind of things are really going to be best quantified by evaluating what the absorbed dose is for a particular tissue. And then this effective dose is really going to be the thing that we're going to utilize to help try and quantify what the population effects of radiation, radiation are. So the stochastic effects on the population. What, what is the uh, probability that it induces a, a cancer in a, a, how many cancers would be induced, let's say, in 100,000 people or so? So let's start with exposure. Exposure is the amount of charge liberated per kilogram of air by the X-ray beam. And the main reason this was one of the first quantities developed is, you know, if you're going to have a quantity, you have to have some way to measure it. And, and measuring exposure was relatively straightforward, right? You could put a little ionization chamber with some air in it and uh, put that in front of the X-ray beam and see how much charge was liberated by just measuring the current that flowed across the ta uh, the the uh, anode and cathode of that uh, ionization chamber. So it was something that could easily be measured. And it's really only defined for photons with energy less than 3 MeV. Remember, if we get up in that higher range, we start to get these crazy things where we can get pair production, right, and photo disintegration. So this really only works well for, for energies under that. And this isn't used for um, particulate radiation. This is really just used to evaluate electromagnetic radiation in that lower range. And of course, exposure uh, measurements, uh, they obey the inverse square law, right? If I, if I measure what the exposure is one foot from the source of gamma rays or one foot from the X-ray tube and I move two feet away, the amount of exposure that I'm going to measure is going to have decreased by, f by four, right? When I double the distance, I'm going to decrease my exposure by the square of that. And it's useful for measuring film exposure, exposure on uh, an x-ray plate, but really it's a poor assessment of radiation risk. So here's what we're talking about, right? You fill some chamber with air, you expose it to an x-ray source. We already talked about because of some of the interactions that we see where you end up kicking electrons out of shells, you create some ions. Those ions now flow towards the positively or negatively charged plates, the holes versus the electrons, and we can measure a current flowing through that circuit, and that current is proportional to the exposure. Early on, you know, one of the things you did with this was put this between the patient and the film or screen, right? And when it reached a certain level, you could actually shut off the x-ray equipment. It said that you had an adequate level of exposure to that x-ray plate. And so hence, hence the term, right, that why we call this the exposure. Um, it tells us nothing about how much energy is being absorbed by the tissues that are being irradiated, right? That's a much more challenging thing to measure. How do you, what do you do? You try and stick sensors in the patient and try to measure that, right? Measuring this quantity in air is a much easier task. It doesn't really tell us where in the body that radiation was being absorbed. So it's not tremendously helpful in terms of knowing the variability, taking into account the variability of uh, different tissue sensitivity to radiation. And for that reason, like I've already said, it's very limited in its utility for evaluating the biologic effects of radiation. Here's the newer concept. Rather than looking about at the amount of charge deposited 
per kilogram of air. Let's look at how much energy is being deposited per kilogram of air. So KERMA, kinetic energy released in media, is not just defined for air, but it's defined for anything. What's the soft tissue KERMA? How much kinetic energy is released into the soft tissues? And so instead of having the units of coulombs per kilogram, right, so charge per unit mass, it has the units of energy per unit mass, joules per kilogram. Uh, and the air kerma really has replaced that notion of exposure. And th they're really related to each other, right? If the amount of charge that was deposited in that air is very closely related to how much energy was de deposited in that air. But for us, we're, we're really most interested in the tissue kerma for various tissues in the body, right? What's the, what's the amount that was deposited in the skin, the soft tissues? What's the amount that was deposited in the liver? What's the amount of energy that was deposited in the bone, let's say, or the bone marrow kind of thing? So we need to extend this notion a little bit. I want, I want to stop for a second because that, certainly that air kerma, right, that's very closely related to that um, exposure that we talked about. If you take that and you multiply it by the size of the area that's irradiated, you get something called the uh, kerma um, area product or the air kerma area product or sometimes called the dose area product. And how many people report the dose area product as part of their fluoroscopy studies, right? And it's one of the measures, one of the quality measures that you can utilize there. It, it doesn't give you everything that you need, right? It, it tells you something about the energy in air, right at the entrance, just before the radiation entered the patient. It tells you something about the energy there, which in truth is cl closely related to some of the energy that's going to be deposited in the patient. But we need to know a few other things, right? We have to know, uh, it's helpful to know what the filtration was on the beam, right? What's the, the quality of our x-ray beam? It, this is really a little bit more of a, a, a measure of the quantity of that x-ray beam. Um, just as a point of reference, for most of our conventional x-ray studies, where we maybe take one, two, or three views or so, we're really talking about one gray per centimeter squared. That, that's, a, that's the air kerma for one of those studies. So if you look at the, just before the radiation enters the skin, you know, that's the kind of value that you would get. And if you did it for one of the GI fluoro studies, where there's multiple minutes of fluoroscopy, perhaps a few spot images, those kind of things, those, are, those studies are typically on the order of 10 times that plain film study. And for some, the complex IR procedures, you know, it's an order of 10, tenfold in terms of that. And of course, those are general rule kind of numbers, but I give them to you just as a little bit of a point of reference, right, for thinking about what some of the doses might be on those studies. Again. It's more complicated than that because so far we still haven't talked anything about where that dose is being applied. And we certainly know that certain parts of the body are much more radio uh, sensitive than others. So, so let, me, let me turn to this notion of absorbed dose. And I'm going to extend the notion of absorbed dose and talk a little bit about exposure. Certainly I could do it with air kerma as well. But absorbed dose is a measure of the amount of radiation uh, energy absorbed per unit mass of a medium. So for us, again, this is going to be, be the patient. Uh, it's, it's still in that units of energy per unit mass or joules per kilogram. At diagnostic energies of air kerma of one milligray um, results in an absorbed dose of approximately one milligray in the soft tissues. Not quite. Usually the soft tissue kerma is a little bit greater than the air kerma. Remember, right, the soft tissues really have a little bit higher Z than air does. So actually there's a little bit more energy deposited there. And then so usually that's about 1.1 times. And then unfortunately as radiation goes through, we talked about these backscattering events that can occur. And if you get a little bit of backscatter and you include that as well, this number can maybe go from 1 to 1.5 if you wanted to convert the air kerma uh, to the soft tissue kerma, but rough ballpark, they're fairly close to each other. If I look at the conversion factor between exposure, right, now this is charge per kilogram and absorbed dose, the same thing is true. Really at diagnostic x-ray energies, that conversion factor, that F, is approximately a one. So if you, if you tell me what the, um, the exposure was, I can 
you usually say that's roughly going to be equal to what the absorbed dose is. As a matter of fact, here's a chart. It's a little, little bit confusing because the F factor for bone numbers are here, and notice the scale is different than the F factor for water and muscle. Here this goes from 0.8 up to 1, and this goes from 1 up to 4. Notice at lower energies, right, the bone value is up here in the 3, 4 kind of range. That shouldn't surprise us, right? The calcium in bone is some of the highest Z tissues in the body. So the conversion factor, that F, is a larger than number 1. Notice here, for muscle and water, that number stays in the kind of the 0 0.88, 0 0.96 range across the range of energies. As you get up, right, as you get up, into this higher x-ray energy, notice that the bone drops down to very close to one as well. So notice bone, water, and muscle at up above 100 keV or so. Those con that conversion factor is very close to one. So just want to emphasize a few things with that, right? That the conversion factors for different tissues are different and they depend on e the energies, right? And, and so just keep that in mind as well. The other thing I wanted to say about absorbed dose, right, is here we have the patient and we uh, illuminate them with this x-ray beam, if you will, and we really want to know how much energy is deposited here. I guess you could figure that out if you could somehow capture all of the energy that escapes the patient, either through scatter or just proceeds through and uh, through the other side of the patient as a primary. The problem is we don't even stop all of those. So that's, this is a very difficult thing to measure. And the other thing I want to mention to you is that the absorbed dose is defined per unit kilogram of tissue, right? So when I calculate the absorbed dose for irradiating the patient's right hand, I get a particular number. And when I irradiate their left hand, I get a particular number. But remember, I irradiated a separate mass of soft tissue here. So in doing this, the absorbed dose has not changed for the study, right? Because the amount of energy deposited per kilogram of tissue that was irradiated isn't changed by that second uh, exposure, right? All right, because I irradiated a different kilogram of tissue when I did that. And so you can see, again, the reason I bring this up is this is helpful to us in terms of the deterministic effects, right? What are the chances that this patient gets a radiation burn to their hand? Well, it doesn't make any sense to be adding the dose that occurred to the left hand when we're interested in knowing what the chance of a radiation burn was to that right hand, right? So absorbed dose for those deterministic effects. On the other hand, you may or, well, wait a second, I need to count both of these because the chance that the patient may get a cancer, a, a DNA strand break from this, does take into account both of these things being irradiated. So we need to extend our notion of absorbed dose to come up with something that better quantifies that stochastic effect. <clears throat> so the absorbed dose is a little bit better measure of the radiation risk. It's really the most useful thing that we have in terms of evaluating those deterministic effects. I already mentioned skin injuries, cataract formation. It still doesn't take into account where that radiation uh, is being absorbed or the radiation type, frankly. So the next step I want to make is, is go to something called equivalent dose. I'm going to extend the notion of absorbed dose to equivalent dose. And the only thing that this does is it takes into account the type of radiation. So was this low LET radiation? Is this high LET radiation? Um, and uh, it gives it a weighting factor for that particular type of radiation. And th this can be important because some of the things that we give patients in nuclear medicine have a combination of some of the different types of radiation, right? Some things emit beta particles as well as, so energetic electrons, as well as produce gamma rays in their decay scheme. Fortunately, both of those have LET values that are low um, or the same, but you can imagine if you people were being irradiated with radiations, part of which was low LET, part of which was high LET, you need to count for the effects of both of those. So it's the units of equivalent dose are 
called the sievert. It's still that amount of energy per kilogram. It's just that we also apply this uh, unitless weighting to that. And here are the weighting factors. So here's that beta and here's that photon. And based on our first uh, few minutes of discussion this morning, right, you understand why these get the same weighting factor because in effect, these x-rays and gamma rays, the first thing they do when they interact in the tissue is produce energetic electrons, right? Protons, um, because they're more massive and have a, uh, um, the same charge as well as an electron, they have a slightly higher weighting factor. Alpha particles, right, two protons, two neutrons, right, quite a bit more massive, a bit more charge, have a much higher weighting factor. Neutrons are a are, are, are more complicated issue, and I'm not going to get into those there, but I just wanted to show those weighting factors. So now, if we know what our absorbed dose was, and we can apply then the appropriate weighting factor to that, we'll get the equivalent dose on that. that. So for us, for diagnostic x-ray energies, that weighting factor is a one, uh, so that really becomes a little bit of a non-issue. Non so now we've accounted for uh, the type of radiation that's depositing within the tissues. And the next thing we want to do is really account for the different types of tissues that end up being irradiated. And that's what we do by extending that notion of um, equivalent dose to effective dose. So effective dose takes into account where that radiation is being absorbed. Um, it attempts to reflect what the risk would be if the entire body got a uniform dose of radiation, right? So we know that when we do certain exams, uh, let's say a chest CT, uh, most of the abdomen structures, especially the lower abdomen and pelvis, don't see much in the way of radiation, and must, most, almost all the radiation dose is concentrated in the thorax. So what equivalent, effective dose, sorry, tries to answer is, if we irradiated the entire body, with the dose of radiation, what would be the dose that we would irradiate it with that would give an equivalent risk of give it some of these stochastic effects from what that chest CT provided? That's what this is doing. And you've got to do that if we want to make comparisons between studies, okay? Of course, that's not a very easy thing to do, and in fact, uh, some of this really in involves um, a little bit of selecting approximate numbers to come up with a calculation, and I want you to, to realize that by the time we finish. So we're trying to capture what that stochastic risk is, that risk of a, a cancer or a genetic risk from that radiation. And again, the unit is still the sievert, uh, joules per kilogram, it's just that we're gonna have these unitless weighting factors again. So how do we, how do we calculate those? So now to get the effective dose, we're gonna separate the body into a bunch of different tissue types, T, right? We're gonna have bone marrow, and we're gonna have uh, skin, and we're gonna have um, breast tissue, and we're gonna have GI uh, tissue there. And for each of those tissue types, we're going to have a different weighting factor depending upon how radiation sensitive it is. And we're gonna multiply that by the uh, absorbed dose actually the equivalent dose, but our weighting factor is one, so those turn out the same. The equivalent dose that that particular tissue type saw as part of the examination. So here are those tissue weighting factors. So here's 1997, here's 1991, here's 2007. Notice these all add up to one. In other words, we're still going to get uh, uh, the same, um, the, the distribution that the entire body sees is a, a value of one quantity, but notice that things like the bone marrow weight quite a bit higher than the uh, surface of the skin, which is 0 0.01, because the skin is relatively radiation insensitive, while the bone marrow is quite radiation sensitive. And that's what these weighting factors are trying to accomplish. Now, the fact that these numbers have changed and changed as drastically have, as they have in some instances ought to give you an idea that this is at best an approximation, right? At best an approximation, uh, this uh, notion of the uh, effective dose. And so doing this, you know, think about how you would do this, right? So let's think about a chest x-ray. So in a chest x-ray, okay, well, the gonad doesn't see any radiation, hardly, none at all. And so that gets multiplied by a weighting factor of 0 0.08. 
the bone marrow, we could calculate the dose of the red bone marrow in the, the thoracic spine and multiply that by the 0.12 factor. And certainly the lung gets a dose, and if we knew what that dose was, we could multiply that by the 0.12. The brain doesn't really see any dose, right, in a chest x-ray, so we'd be multiplying this 0.01 times a zero term, and we'd add those up, and we'd get a number for a chest x-ray right in this order right here. And now if we did a, a CT scan of the abdomen or pelvis, we could do a similar thing, applying the doses of the individual organs received by their appropriate weighting factors and then adding those up. And doing that gives us this table, you know, where we can now start to compare things to each other. But realize this comparison is right at best an approximation, going through this measure, measurement of effective os that we talked about. Does that make sense to everyone? So now does everyone have a feeling for what absorbed dose is, right? What equivalent dose is, and then what effective dose is, and, and, and uh, those numbers. Really, effective dose is meant to be able to allow us to kind of approximate the population effects of radiation, right? It's not meant to be applied on an individual basis. Um, and unfortunately, we see a lot where people try to use it to, to do that, right? Well, what's the effective dose that this patient received during a CT scan, right? That's, that's not what this quantity is really meant to do. Um, so by way of review, right, exposure, ability of radiation to ionize air, right, we talked about the fact that there's something called the air kerma, which is closely related to this, which is really the uh, ability of how much energy is deposited in that air. The absorbed dose, right, it's the energy imparted to the irradiated tissue. We'd love to be able to calculate the absorbed dose in all the different organs in the body because it's frankly those numbers that we're going to then use to extend down to the notion of effective dose. And this is really the thing that we're going to use to calculate our deterministic effects. Our equivalent dose takes into account the radiation type, really not uh, as important to us, but we do see the term. And r the reason that is is just because for the radiation that we'll be working with, that, ra <laughs> that correction factor for the radiation type is a 1. And then our effective dose, where we're measuring that population risk posed by radiation. And this is what we use to help.